right. Now I know you might not be done, and that's okay. You can you can keep drawing. I'm not offended. You can draw while I'm up here. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to continue our series called Pull Your Own Weight. Uh, this is week two of our series where we're talking about who we are as born-again believers. And there's a call on our lives to step up and pull our own weight within the church and to step in sync with other believers because we truly are better together and to step out of our comfort zones and to actually live out the scriptural calling on our lives. Now last week, Ryan shared with us and challenged us to step up by walking in power and love and self-control that we have through the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. And this week we're going to talk about this idea of stepping up and pulling our own weight within the church. Now you might notice throughout this series that there's a thread um, throughout this series of different Encanto characters. Last week we talked about Bruno, even though you're not supposed to talk about him. And this week we're going to talk about Mirabelle. So if you haven't seen the movie, this is Mirabelle uh, from the Disney movie Encanto. And in the movie, Mirabelle is viewed as a not very special person within her community. She has little value to her community and little value to her family because she has no gift. Anyone ever feel like that? Has anybody ever felt like you don't have much to contribute? You don't have much value? Anybody ever feel like the gifts you have, the things and abilities that you can do, they just don't feel like enough? Anybody? Am I alone in this? Fe- okay, I'm, I'm just making sure I'm not alone in this feeling. Now, if you haven't watched the movie, Mirabelle tries to convince those around her that not having a gift doesn't really bother her, but the reality is it really does bother her. She's very bothered by it because she feels ordinary. She feels insignificant. She feels left out. And so she tries to overcompensate for being giftless by looking for other ways to help her family And like Mirabelle, we often determine if we really belong to the body of Christ, if we really belong to the church, if we really have value, and if others have value based on their spiritual gifts. See, spiritual gifts can become something that we are overly proud of or or even sometimes something that we are ashamed of. And the reality is, is that when we look at Scripture, when we look at who we're called to be, we oftentimes feel like we're not enough. Oftentimes, as born-again believers, we actually get fixated on and wrap ourselves up on this idea of spiritual gifts to an unhealthy degree. So I want today to look at the purpose of spiritual gifts, and I want to explore how God is asking us to step up and pull our own weight within the body of Christ. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12 today, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and pull it out. If you don't, there's Bibles underneath the seats around you. The book of Romans is a letter written by Paul to the church in Rome, so it's in the New Testament, and you're going to be looking for the big number 12 today. That is the chapter that we're going to be in for a good part of the morning. Now, if you're already turned there, you might notice that chapter 12 doesn't start off talking about spiritual gifts, but we're going to start in verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. Paul says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, who is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and by by that testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So right off the bat, 
in Romans chapter 12, Paul tells us how we as born again believers should live within the church. He tells us that we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is our spiritual act of worship. So our life should be lived as a continual sacrifice to God. We should be continually offering ourselves as a sacrifice, as a thanksgiving offering, which is a form of worship that is holy and acceptable to God. Paul goes on to say that we shouldn't be conformed to this world, but we should rather be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can discern or understand what the will of God is. So we should be constantly evaluating our lives, constantly asking ourselves, am I conforming to this world? Does my life look like that of a non-Christian around me? And your thought is when I ask that question, well, I don't have any non-Christians that I spend time with. Well, that is another problem for another time. But the question is, does your life look like the world around you? If someone were to look at your life today, would they see Jesus or would they see the world? Once we allow the Holy Spirit to renew us, we begin to live a life that is not of this world. And we begin to live in this world, but not of this world. And then we ask a question that I hear all the time. The question is, well, what is God's will for my life? Anybody ever ask that question? Right? It's a common question. We ask all the time, God, what is your will for my life? God, what do you want me to do with my life? Well, I'm not much of a formula person. I, I was never really good at math. I didn't like it. But here's a formula in Scripture to understand what God's will is for your life. It's actually really simple. Paul lays it out for us. Right here, he tells us how we can figure it out. Here it is. He says, when we are transformed by the renewal of our mind, then we can test and discern what the will of God is. So if you're asking this question, what is God's will for my life? What is God's plan for my life? What am I supposed to do with my life? Then I want to invite you to let the Holy Spirit transform your life and begin to renew your mind. And as you experience this transformation, as the Holy Spirit begins to mold you and shape you to be more like Christ, then Paul says you're able to discern and understand what God's will is for your life. So if you want to know what God's plan is for your life, then let the Holy Spirit into your life to begin to change you. And as that happens, you will begin to understand what God's will is as your mind is renewed. Now if we keep reading in this letter from Paul, we see that in verse 3 he directly addresses spiritual gifts. It says this, For by the grace given to me I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that dip, differ according to the grace given to us." So Paul starts off this instruction on spiritual gifts telling us that his ministry exists only by the grace of God. His ministry exists by the grace of God, which is actually how we, as born-again believers, experience and receive spiritual gifts. See, the spiritual gifts that we are given are given by the grace of God at the will of the Holy Spirit. He also instructs us to not think of ourselves more important than we are. See, our gifts don't make us any more special than anyone else in the body. My gifts do not make me any more special than you as another born-again believer. They're different, but my gifts don't make me any more special. Your gifts don't make you any more special because our gifts are given 
by the grace of God, at the will of the Holy Spirit. They don't make us special. And then Paul instructs us to use sober judgment when we begin to evaluate the gifts that we've been given. Paul reminds us that our spiritual gifts are given in proportion to our faith. The more faith we have, the deeper our relationship with Christ, the more that He is going to trust us with new gifts. The more He's going to trust us with an increased power in the gifts that He has already given us. And Paul talks about this idea that we are one body in Christ. He's actually referencing an idea that he spoke about earlier in his letter to the church in Corinth. And, and though I want to get to these these spiritual gifts here in Romans chapter 12, I think it's important for us to understand what he means when he says that we are one body in Christ. So we're going to actually flip to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read what Paul wrote earlier to the church in Corinth about what it means to be one body in Christ. We're going to start in verse 12. It says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For on one spirit we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. The whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? As it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, then where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, all the parts of the body... Those that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we will bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division among the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member were to suffer, all will suffer together. If one member is honored, then all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So we, as born-again believers, are members of the body of Christ. We're equal members through our baptism into the Holy Spirit. And we all have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us. Paul goes on to say, whether we're a foot or a hand or an eye or an ear, we're all together part of one body. We all together form one body. And he says that it is God who has arranged us within the body. See, God is the one who calls us. God is the one who draws us to himself. And God is the one who leads us and guides us to a local body of Christ that we are a part of. And so if God calls each one of us to a specific local body, then we are there for a specific reason. So if you're sitting here today, if you're watching us online, you are here for a reason. God has called you here for a specific purpose. God is the one who draws you to the body. And if God calls you to a specific body, like ours, then it's for a reason. The gifts that he has given us are also arranged within the body for a specific reason. God doesn't make a mistake. It's not a mistake that you are here today. Paul tells us that each part of the body is important. There should be no division among us because we are working together as a single unit, as one body. So if one of us is suffering, then we all suffer together. If one of us is honored, then we rejoice together because we are one body in Christ. 
So if we, as born-again believers, are all a specific part of the body, then we all have a specific role to play within this body. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But if we each have a specific role, then God has given each one of us a specific gift for a specific reason in order for us to fulfill that role. If you look back a few verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4, it says, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it is the same Spirit who is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord. God works in many different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. So we might be tempted to think like Mirabelle, that we are giftless. But the truth is, if you're a born-again believer, that means that you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've followed Him in baptism, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and God gives you spiritual gifts. Now Paul says there are many different kinds of gifts, but the Holy Spirit is the source of all of those gifts. There are many different ways that we can serve, many different roles that we can serve in within the body, but we're all serving the same Lord, Jesus Christ. And even though God is working in and through us in a variety of different ways, in a variety of different fashions, it's still God who is doing that work. The Bible talks about spiritual gifts all throughout the New Testament, and even some in the Old Testament. And the Bible's list of spiritual gifts is not necessarily exhaustive. And the gifts, they might occur in a various form of combinations. But all spiritual gifts, every single one of them, continues to be available to us as born-again believers until the perfect comes, who is Jesus Christ. Now, there are several different places in Scripture you can read about spiritual gifts. Paul Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 12. Again, in 1 Corinthians 14. There's a chapter on it in Ephesians chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 2, in 1 Peter 4, and in Romans 12. And here's what I want you to do. See, we don't have time to read all of these chapters today. We would be here for quite a long time. But what I want you to do is to study these chapters this week. I want you to open your own Bible during the week and read these passages. And I want you to understand what gifts are found in Scripture. And if you need more help, we've also provided at highhillchristianchurch.org forward slash spiritual gifts. There's a list of almost every spiritual gift listed in Scripture with the description of what that spiritual gift is and what it means. So I want to encourage you to not only read those passages, but also to go to the website and to look at those lists of spiritual gifts and try to understand what they mean. Now, if you need more help than that, at this link, there's also a spiritual gift test. And the spiritual gift test doesn't mean that you have that gift. It's a tool. It's an aid to help you understand what gift you might have. Because the reality is, who is the one who gives us the spiritual gifts? The Holy Spirit. So who's the one who knows what spiritual gift you have? The Holy Spirit. So what do you need to do? you got to ask him, what spiritual gift have you given me, right? These are just tools to help you better understand what those are, to help you better discover what your spiritual gifts are. (laughs) But here's what I want you to know. Every single one of us, as born-again believers, has a spiritual gift. And what are the purposes of those gifts? Well, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verse 12, it tells us this. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. So, we each have gifts, and we're supposed to use them to build up the church. Now, the Holy Spirit, He often works in a variety of spiritual gifts to build and sanctify the church, because the Holy Spirit is the working power of the gospel. So, 
while spiritual gifts might be beneficial to you personally in some way, while spiritual gifts can be used to serve other people, while spiritual gifts can be used to serve those in our community, the primary purpose of spiritual gifts is to build up the local church, to build up the body of Christ. So we have to look at these spiritual gifts that are used to build up and sanctify the church. And to do that, we're going to look at a few of the gifts found in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 6, where we left off. Paul says this, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, to the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, to the one who contributes in generosity, to the one who leads with zeal, and to the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now these are just some of the gifts. There's a whole list of gifts. But what I have found is oftentimes God will take your natural ability and will give you a spiritual gift that complements that natural ability that he has already created in you. To be clear, your natural ability is not a spiritual gift. You might have a natural ability to swing a hammer, okay? You might be good at driving nails. That's a natural ability. And so God might give you the spiritual gift of craftsmanship to come alongside and help you, empower you to be better at that natural ability. You might have a good, a natural ability to talk in front of people. You might love to be around people. And so God will give you a spiritual gift to teach, to help you use that natural ability for his glory. Now, that's not how it always happens. Sometimes God gives you spiritual gifts that are way outside of your comfort zone because all of our spiritual gifts come from the Holy Spirit and they all come at the will of the Holy Spirit. So, to be clear, these natural gifts are not your spiritual gifts, but spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the church. And why does he want us to use our spiritual gifts for the church? It's because the local church is the only hope for our dysfunctional and broken world. And these gifts, they often operate in harmony. They always operate in harmony with Scripture, and they should never be used in violation of biblical parameters. But I want you to understand, when you read about spiritual gifts in Scripture, that they are designed to be interdependent. We, as born-again believers, are strong in the areas where we are gifted, and we are weak in the areas where others are gifted. So we have to serve the body with our strengths, and we have to depend on others within the body for their areas of strength. That's what it means to be a family. That's what it means to be a church. We don't all have the same gift. We're all given different gifts, but we have to use those gifts together to build up the body of Christ so that the world around us can understand and know the love of Christ. Origen, an early church father, I believe says it, So beautifully, he says, one person gives all his energy to the wisdom of God and the teaching of his word. That is the eye of the whole body. Another, after the needs of the brethren and the poor, he is the hand of the holy body. Another is an attentive listener to the word of God. He is the ear of the body. Another is busy admonishing the slack, comforting the suffering, and aiding those in need. He is without without doubt called the foot of the of the body of the church. Each of these has his own special task, but none can function properly without the others. All of us have a gift, and all of us have to use our gift together. Without your gift, my gift is not as beneficial. Without your gift, my gift is not as powerful. Without your gift, my gift cannot be used to its full ability, and vice versa. We all have spiritual gifts, and we're called to use them together. 
Now, earlier I asked you to draw a picture of yourself, right? This is my picture of me, all right? I know it's not very good, okay? I'm not an artist. It's not a natural ability I have, nor is it a spiritual gift that I can pray and ask God to help me with. But this is me, right? And so I wrote some words around me. I wrote creative. I wrote father and son and Christ follower and pastor and friend. I wrote some different words that I would use to describe myself. So as we enter into our time of response, I want you to look at these drawings that you made earlier. And I want you to spend some time over the next few minutes asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I want you to ask for clarity on what spiritual gifts you've been given. He is the giver of the gifts. He knows what gifts he's given you. I want you to ask him. Ask him what gifts he's given you. And if if a particular gift comes to mind as you're praying and, and meditating as we continue in worship, then I want you to write that gift down. Write it down beside the picture that you made of yourself. If you already know what spiritual gifts you have, then I want you to write those down around your portrait. If you aren't sure, then ask. Ask the Holy Spirit, what gifts have you given me? And then, once you know what your gifts are, I want you to spend some time asking the Holy Spirit to give you ideas, to give you wisdom on how you can use your gift to build up this local body. Because the reality is God has called us to an incredible mission as a church. To go out into a broken, dying, messed up world and to be the light of Christ. And the only way that we can do that successfully if each one of us is using their specific gift to help build up the church, to help us connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. See, here's the danger that I see within the church. Oftentimes, we have spiritual gifts but we refuse to open them. Here's what I mean. When you accept Christ, at that moment, when you become born again, the Holy Spirit deposits spiritual gifts inside of you. But oftentimes, we have these gifts that are wrapped, and they're sitting there, and I see, it breaks my heart, I see born-again believers who have gifts that they've been given for decades that they've not yet opened. I was at my parents' house last night. It was my dad's birthday yesterday. He turned 92. And when we came in, my kids brought in the present that we got him. And we set it down beside his chair. And all throughout the night, he maneuvered around the house, maneuvered around this gift, but didn't open it. He opened several cards that we would hand to him, but but still this gift sat beside his chair. He hadn't opened it yet. Finally, I said, hey, hey, Dad, that gift is for you. You need to open it. So he picks it up, and, and he opens it up, and it's a picture that we had taken by our photographer of our kids. And the, the gift doesn't matter in this story. What I want you to see is, Like my dad, so often as born-again believers, we have these spiritual gifts wrapped and ready for us to open. And we're walking through life, and, and maybe we're serving coffee, or maybe we're doing some Love Out Loud events, maybe we're serving in family ministry, maybe we're doing all the right things, we're reading our Bible, we're doing all the things that we're supposed to do as Christ followers, but we're still carrying this gift, this wrapped gift that God has given you specifically to use with your own natural abilities, your own creativity, your own personality. He's given you this gift. And what a shame that we walk through life carrying our gift, doing what we think is right, doing what needs to be done, but not actually accessing the gift that God has given us. How much better would the body of Christ be if we all knew what our gift was? 
I heard it said this week when I was talking to some of our students that, that I was going to be preaching on spiritual gifts. They said, man, we've talked about spiritual gifts a lot. And I said, yeah, we have. They said, yeah, but I still haven't taken the spiritual gift assessment. I don't know what my gifts are. And I said, that's why we keep talking about it. Because you've got to understand what your gift is. And no one can tell you what that gift is other than the Holy Spirit. We can help you. We can provide tools and resources to help you. But you have a unique gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. And our body is suffering. The world is suffering because we're not all using our gifts. That's the challenge today. So we go into our time of response. What spiritual gift has the Holy Spirit given to you? And then what are you going to do about it? Don't walk through life with a present unopened. Because believe me, the spiritual gift is not for your benefit. But, I mean, it does benefit you, builds you up, deepens your relationship with Christ when you're activating that gift, when you're using that gift in His power. There is benefit to that. But more than the benefit to you, there's benefit to other people. People come to Christ because you use your gift, whatever that gift is. And there are people in our world who need to understand how much Christ loves them. And your gift might be the ticket to do that. Whatever that gift is, you might be the answer to their prayer. Because you use the gift that Christ has given you to show other people who he is. God, I'm so grateful that even though I don't deserve it, even though I mess up all the time, God, even though I'm not worthy of this gift, I don't deserve it. You love me enough to give it to me anyway. You bless me so much, God. Not just with salvation, not just with a relationship with you, not with all the blessings you've given me with my family and health and all of these things, God, but you've given me a gift. God, I pray that you help us understand what those gifts are in each one of our lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that you speak to us right now. That you help us to understand the gifts that you have given us. God, give us the courage and boldness to open that gift. No matter how unworthy we feel, it's a gift from you and we might not deserve it. We don't deserve it. We're not worthy, but you are. Help us to use those gifts. Help us to build up your body, not for our benefit, but for yours, so that the world around us will know and understand how much you love them, so that everyone we encounter can connect with you. God, I thank you for this church. Help us to use our gifts together so that other people will connect with you. In Jesus' name. Amen.